everyone to the Zorch podcast. I am Chris Zorch, and on today's show, we have another Notre Dame legend, former teammate, first round pick in 1993, and father of current Minnesota Viking Irv Smith Jr. This is Irv Smith Sr., everybody. Welcome to the show, sir. Good to be here, Big Chris. Good to be here with you, man. Looking forward to spending a little time with you after all these years. Absolutely. But the first question is, how do you feel about being called the father of an NFL player? Well, it was crazy, Chris. You know, when you knew me 30 plus years ago, I'm just Irv Smith. I mean, there's no such thing as Irv Smith <laughs> Senior. And quite honestly, you know, my name didn't change to Senior until a few years ago because, I mean, I was Irv Smith. My <laughs> son was Irv Jr. We called him Little Irv. We called him Irv. We called him everything the son. But his name was not Irv Smith Jr. And then, I, you know, he got to Alabama. And so next thing you know, they started distinguishing between him and me. And I'm like, damn, I got to change my name. <laughs> you know, my driver's license, everything just says Irvin Smith. That's who I am. But it's a oh blessing my that, gosh. that is doing this thing. I'm proud of him. And, you know, I've been there the whole journey with him. And so hmm. to me, he's just he's just a little Irv to me. It's all good. That is beautiful, and and I can't wait to kind of talk about that because, I mean, that's something special. And, you know, you've had um, – in, in your immediate family, obviously, you've been blessed to play, to have a chance to play in the NFL yourself. You have a child that's doing it. Um, as I was doing my research, um, found out that your brother, who's actually older than you, kind of did the same thing, but he played baseball for a little bit as well. My brother's story is crazy, Chris. My brother actually has a, did a did a book. He wrote a book called "Easy Does It: uh, A Journey of a Lifetime." His name is Ed Smith. I'm Irv Smith, and um, his his nickname was EZ. Okay. His brother was a he was he was two years older than me, and he believe it or not had you know scholarship offers to go to every university to play football as a tight end in 1987. When I came out in '89, I was a, I was only a sophomore when he graduated as a senior. He took trips to Penn State, University of Florida, um, I mean, everywhere in the sun. He was a top-rated tight end like I was coming out of high school, but he was before me. But he loved baseball, as I did. But he actually got drafted, like, in the seventh round by the Chicago White Sox. Wow. And, and he actually signed a baseball scholarship to go to the University of North Carolina, believe it or not. Oh, and wow. Then, then turned that down, even on top of everything, and went and played minor league baseball. For nine years, from 1987 until 2000, I'm sorry, till 1987 to 1995, and literally, I was actually finishing my third season with the New Orleans Saints. My brother calls me on the phone. He says, "Irv, he's I'm tired of riding these buses. I'm tired of you know the minor league life." He said, <laughs> "I'm thinking about trying to play football. What do you think?" I literally said to him, "I said, Ed." If there's anybody on the planet that could do this, you're the person that could do it. Oh, my God. After my season, we met in Arizona, got him set up with a trainer. He started working out. Instead of being a baseball player, he started working on being a football player. And believe it or not, Chris, that year, I got him a shot over in the World League to play with the Frankfurt Galaxy. He ended up not just making the team was the starter. He ended up getting an invitation to training camp with the St. Louis Rams. Because the, the guy that was the, 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 the commissioner of the World League actually took the job with St. Louis and said, I want this guy in camp with me. Wow. He ends up signing a uh, practice squad with the Washington Redskins that year. The next two years, he played for the Atlanta Falcons, ended up playing against me. I was the 49ers. They beat us. <laughs> went to Minnesota. They beat Minnesota. <laughs> And he played the Super Bowl, got a Super Bowl ring. Against oh my the God. Broncos. That's a true story, Chris. Oh my so God. Gonna, That's, I don't I'm even know. Gonna, I don't want to interview you. I want to interview him. Listen, anytime you want to talk to me, he, <laughs> he, he, he has a radio show he does every Saturday. I'm telling you, I can put y'all together because he's been doing his radio show for probably 10 years now. I helped him get off the ground 10 years ago. Oh my he gosh. Does it, he does it every Saturday here and he does it remote in, in different locations in, in the Scottsdale Phoenix area. You ever want to talk to him and get his story? If you hear some more, believe me, I'll put you guys in touch. But his story is serious, and he wrote that is a fascinating story. Well, and, and, and I guess it, it it's gonna kind of go with what 
I want to talk to you about. I mean, growing up in New Jersey, I mean, were I mean, did your family have a whole bunch of athletes in it? I mean, your brother, you, I mean, how does that turn out? My mom and dad are, were working class people that were born and raised in Trenton, New Jersey, which is the city. And what happened was I was about two years old. My brother was about four years old. My parents' only concern in life was they, they didn't want to raise us in the city. They wanted to raise us somewhere where we had a chance to be successful in life. Okay. Nobody in my family ever went to college. I'm the first person actually in my entire family Mm. Uh, generations and generations did not only go to college but graduate. Mm. The cool thing was the year after I graduated, the next year one of my other cousins graduated, another one graduated, but I set the precedent. But my parents, all they wanted to do was give me and my brother a safe environment to grow up and live in. So they moved us to a small country town about 35, 40 minutes um, south, outside of Trenton, New Jersey. Okay. In a little town called Browns Mills, New Jersey. That's how <laughs> that's I'm talking about small. It's kind of outside of uh, uh, Cherry Hill area, Philadelphia. It's about maybe 20, 30, 30 minutes. It's about 45 minutes from, from um, Philadelphia. But okay, small little town. And the only thing my mom and dad wanted my brother and me to do was go to school, get, get good grades, and stay out of trouble. And they kept us in sports for one reason. To keep us out of trouble. I mean, that's right, exactly. My dad wasn't. My dad played a little basketball growing up, but we didn't have any athletes from our family. It's just that my, my they wanted to keep us out of bit out of trouble. And lo and behold, they found they created two kids that were very um, uh, athletic and very competitive. And all we did, I had an older brother, and all I tried to do every day was catch him. <laughs> it, just, it just made me. You know, my brother was a tight end like I was, and he was he was highly recruited. I wanted to be highly recruited. Mm. You know, he was everything. He played. My brother played football, basketball, and baseball. Mm. And I'll go back to him. But when he graduated high school in 1987, he was what was called the Tri-State Athlete of the Year: New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. He was wow. He was he was, he was all state football. He was all state basketball and all state uh, baseball. He That's was a, crazy. Uh, and so I wanted to be like him. I mean, I'm the little brother. So all I tried to do was catch him. And oh. the more I tried to catch him, the better I got. That, that is awesome. Well, and then also, well, it's going to lead me to kind of your love of baseball. I mean, is that where it came from? Or, I mean, tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, uh, believe it or not, I, I didn't play football. Well, okay, here's what actually happened. When I was about seven or eight years old, my brother decided he wanted to try out for a football team. And he was good. And he tried out. And he played on a little Pop Warner Pal Little League. And okay. he was a good player. I was big. I was always just bigger. So because of my size, I was too big to play with the kids my age. Oh, so really? Like, it was like 90-pounders, 120s, you know, that kind of deal. Okay. So I had to play with the older kids because I was just too they, – they wouldn't let me play with the kids my age because I was too big. I wasn't fat. Wow. I was just big. So <laughs> what, I, what I ended up playing was what was called fifth quarter. Fifth quarter was for all the kids that didn't play the first four quarters. No. And true story. <laughs> I did that for one year, and I said, you know what? This is not for me. I was probably seven or eight years old. So what I ended up doing from the time I was eight years old until I got to high school, Chris, I played baseball because I love baseball. Mm. I played basketball. I was terrible at basketball. I could barely <laughs> dribble and I couldn't shoot. To this day, terrible. <laughs> but, but I played soccer. Okay. Was, I was like Pele out there, brother. I, nice. I was a big kid that could run. And it, what it did was it gave me the – it actually developed my speed. So – I was the fast person in my family. My brother was, I mean, my brother will tell you, I was always the fast kid. Okay. My brother was, he was more finesse and things like that. He could catch the ball better than I could catch the ball. But I was that kid that you just put me out there and tell me to steal a base or I'll go out there like Pele and I'm, I'm scoring four or five goals in, in, wow. in a day in the, in the soccer field. I did not touch the football field until my freshman year in high school. Oh, that is amazing. That's amazing. So, I mean, when you were growing up, I mean, and you talk about baseball. I mean, who were your your idols in baseball? Well, I was a New York Mets fan. I'm from Jersey. So okay. I can tell you everything about the 1984 Mets. Uh, Daryl Strawberry, Dwight Gooden, Wally Backman, Keith Hernandez. I mean, you name them. I mean, I, I to this day, I'm a Mets fan. 
And wow. I wanted to be Dwight Gooden. I wanted to be Daryl wow. Strawberry. I wanted to be Dave Kingman. I mean, I wanted to be all those guys because I didn't like baseball. I loved baseball. My mm. brother loved baseball. And what happened was when my brother decided to go play minor league baseball after he was the man and everything he did, right. I had two more years of high school. I played my junior in high school, played football, basketball, and baseball, played my senior in high school. And then all the college recruiters came and, um, I, you know, because of my brother, the door was wide open. So they were all coming to my door. Right. And, but what happened was I saw my brother ride buses for two years. Mm. And my mama said, you going to college. <laughs> like and I was like, I'm going to college. So what I did was I made an agreement with every college coach and recruiter, including Coach Holtz, that I could play football and baseball. And that would give me another year, two years, three years to figure out which one I was better at and which sure. one I was, had a, possibly, a possibility of making it to the top. And oh so Coach Murphy, Coach Pat Murphy, who yeah. was our baseball coach and ended up being ASU's coach, and now he's the, the bench coach for a guy named Craig Council, who was my teammate at Notre Dame. I played baseball with him. Coach Murphy got me to come to Notre Dame, played baseball. And this is a true story, Chris. We played in the uh, Sugar Bowl my junior year. Right. And I went out there, and I was very fortunate. I scored a touchdown. And um, I was flying back from um, from New Orleans back to Jersey, and I was going to go Jersey back to South Bend and get ready for my junior year in baseball. Okay. I baseball for my first two years. And I'm on the plane. I just got done. We just got done beating uh, Florida, and Jerome scored all those touchdowns, and we beat up on Florida, and I scored a touchdown. I was on the plane. And I, as I'm flying back to Jersey, I said, you know what, Irv? It's time to give this thing up. I love baseball, but I couldn't hit the really? curveball. Couldn't hit the curveball. I mean, I just couldn't do it. I, I get, You throw me a straight ball, and I'm knocking that thing 400 feet. But you throw me off speed pitches, and I look like a clown. <laughs> and, and, and Coach Holtz had challenged me my sophomore year. He challenged me, and I did a story about that. But he challenged my, my uh, ability to play football and baseball. And he actually gave me uh, an out and told me, you know, Irv, you love baseball so much. He said, why don't you just continue to play baseball? He said, we'll keep you on football scholarship, but you can go play baseball full time. <laughs> wow. That's a true story. I'll tell you, that's a true story. And, um, you know, I ended up playing my sophomore year in baseball. But when I got to my junior year, right after that bowl game, I realized what Coach Holtz was trying to tell me. He was trying to tell me, Irv, I know you love baseball. But football is your ticket. And I, I literally called Coach Murphy and said, Coach, I'm done. And Coach Murphy was like, Irv, I'm glad. He's like, go make that run. And so then wow. my senior year, obviously, D. Brown had got graduated, was first round pick, and it was my shot to, to be the guy. And I went out there and you know, God blessed me. I had a good, you know, senior season, and uh, the rest is history, man. But yeah, my you know, Coach Holtz really pushed me in the right direction. You know, Coach, you you and you both you and I both know that Coach Holtz is a magician. He knows everybody's <laughs> buttons. Coach. Chris Doris's buttons is different than Earth Smith's buttons. Right, right. Buttons, and he knows those buttons. Yeah. And actually, he still knows them to this day. Believe to it. To this day. Believe and, it. And if he see, look, we saw him down in Miami some years ago. We played Alabama. And he was like, Chris Doris, how you doing? How's you this? Earl Smith, how's your mom and dad doing? It? I mean, he's talking to us. Like he saw us last week. Right. And he, had, right. And he had coached us at that point in over 20, almost 25 years. Crazy, man. Amazing. Well, it's interesting. I kind of want to go back a little bit because I want to talk a little bit about how Irv Smith Sr., sorry, uh, how Irv Smith got to Notre Dame because um, I, I, in my research, I, and I actually didn't know this, but it's kind of an interesting story. Can you please share it with the, with the audience? Well, I tell you, it's, it's crazy. So, you know, my, my recruiting, you know, we all get five official visits. Right, and I'm going right. to tell you my five visits. My five official visits that I had scheduled, I went to USC because I'm a kid from New Jersey and I wanted a free trip to California. <laughs> so flat after out, USC, flat out. So after USC, UCLA called me and said, well, if you went to USC, they're at Watts. Come see us in Beverly Hills. So I, <laughs> so I took another free trip out to UCLA. Oh was my not going to either school because my parents couldn't afford to fly across country to see me. So that was just trips to go for free trips. Oh, then my I trip, God. I tripped to Florida State 
which was Deion Sanders' senior year. He had just got done playing baseball. It was Florida State, Florida weekend. He showed up to the game in a white limousine and a black tuxedo. Okay? Oh, my God. Then, then my fourth trip was Clemson University with the Death Valley. Danny Ford was the head coach. My fifth visit was Auburn University. So you're like this. Well, that's five visits. What about Notre right. Dame? Right. Like, <laughs> Where's Notre Dame at? <laughs> so I get, I get a phone call the Friday before I'm going to Auburn. Now, here's the deal. Bo Jackson back then was the man. Bo, Bo knows. Bo played football. Bo played baseball. Who wanted to be Bo Jackson? Hello. <laughs> so, guess, so guess where I'm going to college? I'm going to Auburn. I already knew from jump I was going uh, to Auburn University. No questions asked. Wow. It was my fifth visit, which is the last visit, which means a whole bunch of other kids that went there on their visits. I get a phone call the Monday before my trip. Auburn called coach who by the name of uh, Pat Dye Sr. calls me on the phone and says, well, not Pat, but his recruiting coordinator called and said, Irv Smith, we got some bad news. We just signed two tight ends from the state of Alabama. We don't have a scholarship for you. I'm like, what are you talking about? My life was going to Auburn being Bo Jackson. Wow. So they literally told me, this isn't a joke. You know, good luck to you. So I was Click. like, you know what? Okay, cool. So guess where I'm going now? I'm going to Clemson. I said, okay, great. I'm going to Clemson. Called up Clemson guy. Said, hey, you know what? I'm coming to Clemson to be a, to be a Clemson Tiger. Well, a guy that we all know by the name of Vinny Serrato took no. He didn't take no for an answer. Vinny kept calling me, kept calling me, kept calling me. Ersmith, I just heard you got a, another visit. I said, yes, but I'm going to Clemson. He said, okay, that's cool. <laughs> he said, but you got a free trip. He said, come, just come to Notre Dame for this free trip. So I was like, you know what? All right, cool. Now, here's what's crazy. Uh, Chris, I can't make this story up. At the time, my brother, my old, my only sibling, was playing baseball for a team called the South Bend White Sox. Yes, absolutely. That My brother was living in South Bend. Oh, my God. Baseball, minor league baseball. He was in his third season with the South Bend White Sox. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to go out and see my brother and take a free trip to Notre Dame. <laughs> and I let them know that that morning I committed to Clemson. Clemson begged me, Irv, do not go on that trip. Wow. Like, why not? They're like, Irv, whatever you do, don't go on that trip. I was You're like, like, it's a free trip. Y'all ain't got to pay for it. Don't worry about it. Yes. <clears throat> so I go. D Brown was my host, and Rodney Culver was my second host. Oh. So I go on a trip. And the whole trip, I am fighting it. I'm like, I'm not coming here. Like, I kept saying, I'm not coming here. I'm not wow. coming here. I'm not coming here. By the time the trip was over, I'm going to Notre Dame. What, what happened to me, Chris, was this. I met guys. They see Florida State, Clemson, USC, UCLA. All they talked about was football, 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 football. Hmm. You, got, you guys just won the national championship in 1988. All D. Brown talked to me about. All Rodney Culver talking about all the guys that, that I met on campus. All they talked about was, Herb, if you come to Notre Dame, it's going to change your life forever. And this is true, Chris. I can't make this up. I didn't. I didn't hear nobody talk about that at any other school except the Notre wow. Dame. They they didn't wow. brag about winning on national championship. They said, Look, you're going to play big time college football. You're going to be on TV every single week. You're going to play in front of a, a sold out crowd. That's guaranteed. But what it's going to do for you, it's going to change your life forever. You're going to be a Notre Dame guy. People are going to recognize you and your degree everywhere you go across the world. And I was like this, wow, I never mm. heard this from anybody before. Mm. So by the time the visit was over, Chris, I fought it so hard. I said to myself, if I don't go to Notre Dame, something's wrong with me. Wow. My mom and dad, my mom and dad went to USC. They didn't go to, they didn't go to California with me, but they went to Clemson. Okay. They were going to go to Auburn. And I told the mom, dad, don't waste your time, gas, money, or nothing to go to Notre Dame because I ain't going there. Right. I get off that plane, Chris. I looked at my mom and dad. I said, I'm going to Notre Dame. Oh they couldn't have been happier, bro. They were like, oh, my gosh, we were praying for this. It was Really? Crazy. And I'm telling you, D. Brown, Rodney Culver, you, the whole Notre Dame crew that was there before me is what changed my mind. And I'm going to tell you this right now, Chris. I put this on everything I love, bro. The greatest, the greatest decision I ever made in my entire life. Couldn't be happy. Wow. That's amazing, Dave. That's true. That story. is an amazing story.
story, man. True story. That's amazing. Did you have a chance to see, hang out with your brother any or? You know, um, I, I think he came by campus for a hot second, but, you know, I was, I, like I said, when I got there, Vinny had me so set up with, I mean, to the point where, watch this, you know, when you go on your visit, you got 48 hours, okay? Right. So here's what happened. I was so unagainst, I was so against going to Notre Dame, I had a basketball game that Friday. So instead of going in Friday morning, I played my basketball game. I left no. at halftime, got no Notre Dame way. back. 9, 10 o'clock at night. So what oh Vinny did God. was, what Vinny did was, instead of me leaving Sunday morning, like most recruits had to leave because of the 48-hour rule, right. I didn't have to leave till that night. So they ended up setting me up with a basketball game. That's where I went to the basketball game with Rodney and got a chance to spend time with him. Hmm. And that all those things put together was it was it was a per, it was the perfect storm that allowed me to see what the opportunity was. It wasn't a rust visit like it could have been. Right. And it, it helped me make the greatest and smartest decision of my life. And that's true. Oh, my gosh. That, that is a great story, man. That, that's it. And then so you, you, come, you come back. I mean, you talk to your parents. You, you said they were kind of floored. They were praying about it. But, I mean, what's that conversation? It's like, you know, mom, dad, you know, I really, I really t- thought about this. I met some great guys. Hey, I, I want to go to Notre Dame. The conversation was this simple, bro. I walked off the plane. This is back in the day, of course, where your parents were waiting for you at, right. at the gate right. when you walk out the gate, not not at the, <laughs> not at the rivals. I mean, I'm, I'm 17 years old. My parents are waiting at the gate. I walked off the plane, and there wasn't a conversation. I said, Mom, Dad, guess what? Really? I'm going to Notre Dame. Oh. They was like, oh, my oh. gosh. And they hugged me, and we cried, and we, we, we were excited because – my mom was in education for 35 years. She worked at a community college and she was the, I mean, okay. my play like said, my mama told me you're going to college. She didn't, she didn't ask me. She told me because I was the first and they knew you know, that of course, you know, our parents, of course, it's like being parents. Our parents know a thousand times more than we know at 17, right. 18, right. 19 years old, but right. we don't know that. Right. Right. So my mom and dad was praying for that. And I didn't know it. They never told me one time. When I told them I was going to Clemson, okay, good. You, you want to go Clemson? I mean, it was my choice. Right. Man, when I tell you that there was no, there was no, uh, there was no feedback. There was no pushback. It was, oh my gosh, we're so happy. We're so grateful. We were praying for this. And I'm telling you, bro, from the moment that I made that decision to go to Notre Dame, it's been all gas and no brakes, bro. It's just been mm. the greatest blessing. You know, I tell people all the time. You know, playing in the NFL and playing, you know, with all these other great players that played at Florida State, and Miami, and all this stuff. You know this, Chris, because you experienced the same thing. We're out in crowds of people, and they're like, "Hey, where'd you go to school? I went to Florida State." Oh, yeah. And he said, "No, no name. You in no name?" And then, the, then the other kicker, you all hear this one. Who was your coach? Louis, Louis, all super guys. I mean, <laughs> Chris, Chris, you experienced the same thing I experienced. We, we listen. We come from the same cloth. And we get the same reaction. They act like those other guys don't even exist. Right. All they want to do is talk to us about Notre Dame and playing for Lou Holtz and playing with the Chris Zorches and playing with the Rocket Ishmaels and playing with the Tim Browns and playing with the – I mean, I mean, come on. That's just how it is. It's crazy. But when we're there, it's just – we just we just one of the fellas. But mm. other people, they feed off of us because of all the great players – we spent, we rubbed elbow with and blocked, and what made us right. great players and great people is because the, the players, the people that we were around for those four years. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. You are listening to the Zorch podcast with our guest, Irv Smith Sr. See, I'm, I'm always in. <laughs> so, along with your, your time at Notre Dame, um, talk to us about one of your favorite moments it doesn't necessarily have to be football but but talk to us about one of your favorite moments oh man favorite moments oh man so or how about this give me give me a football one and then give me a non-football one well you know my, my greatest football moment was my first touch and I, I scored at Notre Dame you know I was I was a junior you know it took me three years to really even get on that field because I'm gonna tell you I'm gonna talk, start by telling you this Chris when I took my recruiting visit to Notre Dame as you know, every recruit, the last thing they do before they leave campus, they meet with Coach Holt Sunday. He talks to them, gives them a the little pep talk, and they leave, hoping, and he's trying to recruit them. Right. 
I go see Coach Holtz, and he's he's trying to recruit me, but he tells me this to my face. Er Smith, we have a tight end here by the name of Derrick Brown. We love him. He's a freshman. He's going to be an amazing player. He's a freshman All-American. Derrick Brown will be our starting tight end for the next three years. If you come to Notre Dame, you will be Derrick Brown's backup for the next three years. But if you do everything I tell you to do, he said, Derrick Brown's going to be a first-round draft pick. I'll make you a first-round draft pick. Oh. This is a true story, bro. He Now, remember this. Wow. Guys came to Notre Dame to play. They want to start. They don't want to hear about – they don't want to hear from the head coach. <laughs> Look, I can go to Clemson and play. I can go to Auburn to play. I can go to right. Indiana and have a chance to play. He, now, I saw D. Brown on television, 6'7", 260. <laughs> the kid – I mean, D. Brown puts his hands up in the air. It looks like he can dunk without, without even <laughs> – Okay, facts. So he tells me this, and I'm like this. Okay, well, thanks for your honesty. So when I made the decision to go to Notre Dame, I made the decision knowing that unless D. Brown got hurt, which the chance he wasn't, I was going to be a backup for three years. Now, remember wow. this. There, other positions, there's there's always two defensive ends and two defensive right, tackles right, and right, two right. linebackers. There's only really one oh, tight end. Right, right, exactly. One like they say, Irv, y'all gonna be, I mean, nowadays they might do, they weren't gonna be no two tight ends on the field. So, long story short, my junior year, I hadn't scored a touchdown since my senior year in high school. Mm. Chris, I wanted, I wanted, to, I wanted to score a touchdown so bad. When I saw that, <laughs> when they threw that ball in Indiana, I can honestly tell you the only thing I saw was the end zone. All I saw was the end zone. Uh. Well, that's I didn't great. See no yard lines. I didn't see no defensive players. All I knew was by the time I laid on that ground, I needed to be across that end zone. So the mm. greatest, my greatest memory of my Notre Dame experience was that first touchdown I ever scored against Indiana my junior year. And here's the cool thing, and you can see, you can watch it on tape. Lo and behold, when I scored that touchdown, Derrick <laughs> carried me off that daggone field. Amazing. Amazing. And I had to tell him, let me down because I was on the PAT. And it goes <laughs> over like, Irv, get back out there. Get back out there. Get out there. Because I was on the PAT. And was, oh, my I God. Was D. Brown. If you oh watch that God. field, you will see D. Brown carry me off that field. And that's how close all of us brothers were. Ah. Uh. That's amazing. And, and, and think about this. I mean, you're talking about uh, a kid who had obviously had other offers and sitting down in front of the head coach and saying, hey, you're not going to play here for three years. I mean, that's amazing. And the idea that you took that as motivation and then understanding that, you know, hey, and then, oh, by the way, the relationship you guys had was amazing. That's not necessarily uh, a normal thing. I mean, if some guy is playing ahead of you, and sometimes you guys aren't friends. Well, you know, you know, it's so crazy, D. Brown, uh, Chris. You had D. Brown, then you had me, then you had Oscar, McBride, Oscar, then you had Pete Kraplewicz, then you had, I mean, it was the list. And when I tell you to this day, my closest friends, Oscar McBride, Derek Brown. Mm. Listen, we, when we went out to practice, we was out there to beat each other out. Like we mm. listen. My goal every practice from the day I got on that campus was to de- was to beat D Brown out. His goal was to keep me from beating him out, and get and Oscar's goal was to beat both of us out. Mm. And guess what it did? It made mm. all three of us great. It made us right. better. Exactly. Exactly. That's all exactly. it did. And I'm telling you, bro, we laugh about it. We got sayings, you know, T-E's, G-O. I mean, dude, we, when I tell you that the brotherhood that we formed in 32 years ago. That's amazing. Is, is it strong today? You know, he passed away a couple years ago. Who who carried me at that funeral was Oscar McBride. Mm. You know and I mean, we are brothers and we are brothers for life. Mm. You know, and it's amazing because when you think about, I mean, think about what if you, you decide not to take that trip, right? Think right. about if your brother isn't in South Bend playing baseball. I mean, let's, or, or let's think about if they wanted another tight end 
I mean, you talk about the relationships that are formed and regardless if it's first, second or third string, it's those relationships that make Notre Dame special because at the end of the day, Notre Dame is a brick and mortar institution, just like Clemson, just like USC, just like Baylor. Okay. But it's the people that make it so special. And when you share those stories, when you talk about the relationships that you have with not even people that you're competing against, but guys that you're roommates with, guys that you were, you know, you know you're on the team with them, but you guys aren't necessarily hanging out. But five, ten years down the line, you see each other, it's as if you you guys are in the same locker room again. That's facts, man. I'm telling you, listen, I travel all over the world, and wherever I go, if there's a guy that I played with that I know of, I mean, here's the other thing, though, man. It's not even just classmates. I, I spent time with guys that were older than me that never played in Notre Dame. When I was there, they were there before me. And I spent time with guys that were there after me. I mean, Bobby Brown and Kim and Tatum. I mean, there's so many guys. I mean, I, when I say so many, it's so many guys I've met at golf tournaments, guys I've met at nerdy events. And we never crossed paths at Notre Dame because I was younger, they were older, or vice mm-hmm. versa. And, man, the brotherhood is so strong that we, we, we failed to even realize that we weren't there together. <laughs> we're like, wait a second, wait, wait, we, we went, what, what, what we say? But we, but we, we had friends, the brother. That's we had, great. I was very blessed that when I was there, you know, you were a junior, I believe, my freshman year, mm-hmm. and then you were senior my sophomore right. year. Right. Your class, the class before you that were seniors, and then so on and so forth, man, it, it didn't matter what class we were in. We were all just brothers. And and to this day, I have to think about what class we were in, but it didn't matter. We were all brothers right. in the same brotherhood on the same team. We right. we all had the same story. Look, we can start telling stories, and then I can tell the story to somebody, and you can come to the room. It's the same story. <laughs> people, would like, people would think we lying. We're like, man, right. I'm telling you, this is true. Right. Don't tell me about when we played Penn State, Coach Holes went off on us. I mean, I'm telling you, we can tell you. <laughs> you know, he was there. That is amazing, man. I mean, and it's interesting because when you talk about those relationships and kind of how special they are, and I don't want to take away anything about just football, but you were also on the baseball team. So share with us a little bit about that kind of. I know you talked to Coach Holtz about it beforehand, but, I mean, what was it like being on two teams, not necessarily the relationships, but just the strain on your body? Well, first off, Chris, I, you know, I played baseball. You remember Frank Jacobs, of course, right? Absolutely, yes. Frank, you know, Frank obviously played baseball too, and Frank was a tight end. Frank was a stud. You talking about my boy? I'm oh. about, Frank Jacobs is one of my top five people out there at all time. That oh. dude was such a he, I mean, but here's what's cool. So right now we we have a, we have a, a text message between uh, within Notre Dame baseball. And I'm, I'm, I'm in that one, too. And it's like 30 of us. You know, mm. and I play with probably 15, 20 of them. And, mm. like, every – I'm working all day long. My phone be going on. Everybody sending messages. Man, remember it this year? Remember we did – I mean, these dudes is crazy, bro. They tell us stories oh about God. stuff. And, I mean, it's so cool because, like I said, I went to Notre Dame. One of the reasons I went to Notre Dame was because of Coach Murphy. That Coach Murphy is my guy. And mm. then I play with Craig Council and lots of guys – and, and then when I came out to Arizona where I live, Coach Murphy took the ASU job. So for the next two, three years, when I came to Arizona before I moved here, I would stay with him. I stayed with Coach Murph. You know wow. what I mean? Like, I'm telling you. And once again, my relationship with him came from Notre Dame. You know what uh. I'm saying? And Coach Murphy told me when I, when I gave baseball up, he was like, Irv, good job. Go do mm. it. He didn't try to hold on to me. He's like, Irv. Go do your thing. I support wow. you. Wow. You know, and once again, man, the relate. So, so I, I was very blessed that I I played with all these Notre Dame baseball guys for till my junior year, and these these are my guys too. And they they tell crazy. I mean, the the, the assistant baseball coach, Coach Gibby, was telling a story about when we was in Minnesota playing baseball, and I was like, "Dang, Coach, you remember that story?" I mean, it's like wow. this is thirty years ago. That's great, you know? man. And I'm telling you, man, for me. 
the blessing is that I was able to do all those things and make all those relationships with all those amazing guys. Mm. Mm. Well, I mean, it, 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 kind of on those lines, and, and it may be the relationships, but give us kind of a, a non-athletic moment. I mean, and, and, and you obviously were blessed. You had a chance to play two sports. But, I mean, maybe, you know, walk across campus in the freezing weather, um, you know, a class or something like that. I mean, talk to us a little bit about kind of a non-athletic moment for you. Well, I'm going to tell you, the, the, the first non-athletic moment for me was when I got to Notre Dame and I found out that I had to pass a swim test to graduate. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean I have to pass a to graduate? Swim test? They like you have to learn how to swim, oh my or you God. gotta pass a swim test if you want to oh graduate. God. So oh I'm in, I live in Grace Hall on on the, the North Quad, and the pool was on the, the South Quad, and the class was in November December. When it's like <laughs> 10 below. So my objective was I need to figure out how to pass this dad going swim test because I wasn't trying oh to take no God. swim class. Oh now my, my roommate Nick Smith. Nick was like, nah, I can't swim. I ain't doing it. I'm just going to take the class. So Nick went ahead and bit the bullet. So <laughs> I find out to pass the test, you got a breast, it's an Olympic sized pool. You got a breaststroke down, breaststroke back, backstroke down, backstroke back. Now I'm thinking, oh this shouldn't God. be that tough. I ain't never swam in an Olympic sized swimming pool before. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking it's like some little backyard pool, out the ground pool I grew up with. Chris, oh my this god. Side swim pool ain't no joke, bro. All, <laughs> all I can tell you is I swam down. I was like, damn, it's tough. Then I swam back. I'm gasping for air. Then I backstroke down. Then I found somehow I was able to backstroke back. Then you had to uh, tread water for a minute. Brother, oh I almost grabbed, man. <laughs> <laughs> when I, when I, but, but somehow when I finished, I looked up at the lady and she's like, you passed barely. <laughs> <laughs> barely. <laughs> oh, you let me know. Oh Some my God. I passed. And oh uh, I'm gonna tell you, brother, that was that was eye opening at best. Because I'm telling mm. you right now, but I'm gonna tell you an even funnier story. So I, I'm in high school, I'm trying to I wanted to, I wanted to find a way to go to college, and they told me I had to take some some certain classes, college prep and things mm -hmm. like that. And I take Spanish. So I took a couple years of Spanish, and quite honestly. Um, I got through that Spanish class, but I, I didn't get through it very well. But I, 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 I passed it and I got the credit. That's all I'm going to say to <laughs> So we get to class my freshman year. We get to school, and I start hearing, hearing like words around camps where you can actually take a test and pass out of classes right. like right. What, and get credit for it. So, I said, so they said, you can take tests and pass out of Spanish. <laughs> Now, how in the world am I going to struggle through Spanish high school and think I'm going to go ahead and take a college class and pass oh out of it? Because I walked in that test, trying to pass out of two Spanish levels. <laughs> man, come on, man. It was a joke. It was, it was like, welcome to Notre Dame. Okay? <laughs> so th those, and that, those were birthed my freshman year, which opened my eyes up to this school is not like other schools. Right. You ain't just right. gonna come here and just breeze through stuff. I don't care if you're an athlete, that make no difference. You're gonna work for everything you get. And that's the thing that Notre Dame did for me, is it taught me that anything that I wanna have, if I work my butt off, I can have it. Mm, mm. That is amazing, man. All right, so let's kind of fast forward a little bit to the opportunity you have to being drafted. Um, kind of what was that like and were you at home? I mean, did you have family there? I mean, talk to us a little bit about what it was like for you, your draft day. Well, I'm going to tell you, Chris, um, once again, the draft to me was really for my family, my mom and dad. I wanted to be a part of it. And I had gotten a, a, a call, an opportunity from the NFL to actually go to the NFL draft. And back then it was in New York. Okay, right. And I was a potential first rounder. You and I both know that all that means is there's a chance you're going to get drafted. Right, they, right. They <laughs> so, so I ended up deciding to go with me and my mom and dad. My agent was there, and I was there. Drew, Drew, Drew Bledsoe was the first pick of that draft. Uh, he was there. 
Rick Meyer was the second pick of the draft. He wasn't there. Yeah, he was at home, right? Yeah, he was at home. Yeah. Um, lo and behold, Jerome was 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 I think Jerome was there. He was the tenth pick. Okay. Um, my buddy Willie Rofe was the eighth pick. He was there. He got drafted with the Saints with me. The reason I'm telling you the story because um, there was probably fifteen, and back then there was only I believe it was only twenty eight teams back then because there was right. no expansion year, so there was only right. twenty eight versus thirty two now. Right. Right. So lo and behold, there was about fifteen of us there. And Chris, do you know? I was the I was the last person in the draft at the draft. I was the 20th pick, but I was the last guy to get drafted. So oh there was a chance I was gonna slip to the first, second round because right, I right. was gonna pick you. And so I'm the so I'm in I'm in that in that that back room and I'm the, like <laughs> everyone else, I mean the first pick to bless was there and <laughs> five and seven and ten. I think mm. I think the fifteenth or sixteenth guy was the last one there. Wow. And then I'm sitting there, and I'm like, oh, man. I, 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 right? <laughs> so, but my mom and dad were there, and when, I, when, when the Saints traded and picked me up and called my name, it was like, oh, my. But here's the thing, Chris. Back then, the first round, first, they had, like, 45 minutes per team. So when right, I, I'm, the right. draft started at, like, noon, and I got drafted <laughs> at, like, 7 p.m., bro. You had to Chris, sit through bro. all of that. It, it ain't as glamorous as people think. <laughs> it was serious, man. And, and I, like I said, I was the last guy in the room. Oh, Everybody my God. Else had it. Matter of fact, Willie was the first Saints pick that year. He was the eighth pick, and he took the jersey in the hat. So they didn't have no. a jersey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to draw a picture. They didn't have nothing left. <laughs> Willie, Willie, Willie teases me to this day. Irv, I got the jersey. Irv, I got oh the jersey. Oh, my God. Like, That's hilarious. He teased, he teased me a couple months ago. Irv, I still got the jersey. <laughs> oh, my God. That is great. That is a great set. But, well, but, but it's so interesting because, you know, it's one of those moments that you don't necessarily know about. You don't see it on TV. It's kind of back there. You're sweating. I mean, Woo! you know, and, and like you said, it's, it was like 45 minutes, and they took like 49 minutes and like 59 seconds before they made the pick. Absolutely. They really did, brother. They, they Listen, there was no like two, five minutes. No, they took every single second of their time, and then if they traded the pick, the next person, they will take the rest of their time. Exactly. Right. It right. Was, it, was, it, was, it was an experience that I can tell you, man, I will never forget that experience for the rest of my life. It was a blessing. My mom and daddy were both there mm. and it was a proud moment, man. And it was hard work. It was a moment that I worked my butt off to get to. And I'm very grateful that I had the opportunity. That is awesome, man. That is, that is absolutely awesome. Okay. So now give us a moment that you, enjoy. do you have a favorite moment that you had when, when you're in the NFL? In the NFL, you know, my favorite moment, you know, believe it or not, the one year that I played in San Francisco, I played in San Francisco in the 98 season. I played okay. against, I played against them for five years because back then the Saints and the Niners were the same division. Right, right. So we always played them twice a year, and I got to get to I got I got to go against, you know, Brent uh uh, uh Brett Jones and Steve Young and Jerry right. Rice and uh Merton Hanks. And I mean the list goes on. Bryant Young, our teammate, and Junior Bryant. I mean, it was just so many guys. And so I get the and then here I'm not sure if you know about this, but Vinny Serrato was the guy that took me to New, to Notre Dame. Vinny Serrato was the same guy that took me to San Francisco. Really? Vinny Serrato was the same guy that took me my last year to the Washington Redskins. <laughs> oh my God! So when I got to San Francisco, instead of admiring all these guys and playing against them. It was the first time I got to play with all these guys, and I'm catching balls from Steve Young, and I'm playing with Ken Norton Jr., and I'm, you know, uh, running back was Garrison Hurst, and of course we had Jerry Rice was one receiver, and JJ Stokes was the other receiver, and Terrell mm. Holmes was the other receiver, and I'm the tight end. Mm. I mean, it was that was that year. I, people always ask me my favorite season. I say, oh, well, hands down, was the year I played in San Francisco. Wow. It was a fun year. I played with a star-studded group of guys, and they were great guys. I'm talking about. You know, we would get done practice and, and Mary would be like, all right, who's buying lunch? And Jerry, oh. I'm buying lunch. And they buy, you know, he's buying, you know, $1,000, $2,000 worth of lunch for the team. And they mm. carry in. I mean, just, it was just a fun year, man, that I'll never forget. 
Wow. Wow. Well, okay, so I found a quote that you talked about. You said that you like football, you don't love football. And this was kind of toward the the end of your career. Can you talk to us a little bit about what, what that means? Absolutely. You know, my son loves football. My son, my son played basketball his entire life. When he was two years old, I got him playing basketball. My son could literally dribble two basketballs at one time like this when he was two years old. Mm. All his, his all he wore every day was was basketball shorts, a, a basketball tank top, Allen Iverson, Kobe, whoever it was, <laughs> and a headband. I mean, he was a basketball <laughs> kid. He played. He played. Now you know Mike Bibby, the basketball player, right? Son played on Mike Bibby's team for about 10 years. So my son was a basketball player. I didn't let him play football until he got in eighth grade. The day I let him play football, he, and he asked me to play football since he was like five years old. And I was like, nope, 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 nope. Finally, when he was eighth grade, I was like, all right, you can play. The day he started playing football, the kid walked different. He talked different. His chest was still, he's like, I'm a foot. I mean, he literally. Wow. And I'm telling you the truth. And he, he continued to play basketball because it kept him in shape. But there was no doubt in anybody's mind this kid was – and he could have went to college on the basketball scholarship all day because he could play basketball like it's nobody's business. Mm. But the kid was like, he loved football. I love baseball. That was my sport. I just couldn't hit the curveball. But there was not a day that I did not enjoy going out there and putting some sunflower seeds in my mouth and going out there and taking <laughs> BP and, right. and catching fly balls and throwing the ball from deep right field because I love baseball. I played football because I was good at it, and okay. it was my ticket, but I didn't love football. And, and I, I didn't brag about that. It just was how it was because sure. my heart was – I didn't wake up – and the day that I walked away – let me tell you how I walked away from the NFL. So I, I finished my season. I went to San, I was in San Francisco on a two-year contract. I ended up playing one year of it, and I ended up getting traded to Cleveland, expansion year 99 for the second year of the contract. Dwight Clark, Clark and Common Policy brought a bunch of us from San Francisco to Cleveland. Okay. We opened up the new Browns. Had a horrible season. We were like one, I think we were one in 15. Our one win was a Hail Mary against the Saints in the Superdome, my old team. Jesus. Okay. That, that was our one win for the season. So long story short, um, the season was over. I was a free agent. I left Cleveland. I was so tired of football because I had a horrible experience that year with the head coach and everything about it. I came back to Arizona, and in my mind, I retired. I was done. Okay. I, I put on a bunch of weight, and I was pretty much just, just waiting on retiring. Get a call from Vinny Serrato, who recruited me to Notre Dame. No way. Who took me to San Francisco. Said, Herb, we need, we need a backup tight end in Washington. We want you to come here. I said, Vinny. I I'm not, I'm in no shape. He said, <laughs> he, said Irv, he said, North Turner wants to see you. We sent you a plane ticket. So I said, okay. I flew out to, to Washington. They put me through some workouts. I was terrible. Oh I my gosh. I was 20 pounds overweight. Oh my god. I was god. terrible. I got on the plane. I flew back home. I just knew they were gonna sign me. <laughs> <laughs> they called me and said, Irv, we know you need to lose about 20 pounds. They said, lose 20 pounds and show up for training camp. I was like, are you serious? Wow. So I came back to Arizona and I said, okay. I lost those 20 pounds. I only had about three weeks to do it. I lost oh those 20 God. pounds. I mean, I worked my butt off. <laughs> I get to camp. I go through camp. And I'm about two weeks into camp. And Lily Chris... We had a we had now this is back when when walkthroughs were like three quarter speed, but it still was a walkthrough. Right, right. But we also had two a days. Right. So, so we had a walkthrough, and Chris, it was the toughest practice of my entire career. It was a walk really? mentally, Chris. I was <sighs> like, I can't do this. So I go so I go back into the, my hotel room between practices. And then the second practice was it was a full go, you know, right. practice. Right. I got up. I called my agent. I said, I'm done. He said, what do you mean? I said, bro, I can't do this. He's like, go talk to Vinny. So I go in. I say, hey, Vinny, can't do this. Vinny says, go talk to Norv. I go say, Coach Turner, I can't do this. Now, at this point, the whole team is going outside the practice. Sure, right, exactly. In, in, in pads. office, 
And they're all looking at me like, what's Irv doing in Coach Turner's office? And I'm like, Coach, I can't do it. Coach Turner was like, Irv, you need a week off. You need a month off. He said, I tell you what, we're going to give you a month. He said, go home, get yourself straight. We'll call you in a month. If you want to come back, we got you. I said, all right, Coach. I packed up my stuff. Now, my family at this time still lived in New Jersey. I'm in Washington. I get my, I, I had my car shipped out there. I get my car. I drive to Jersey. Then I flew down to New Orleans. My son was having his, uh, his uh, second birthday party. Let me see, 98, 99, 2000. Second birthday party. Okay. I flew down to go see him. I, I flew down to go see him in New Orleans. And um, I was like, you know what, man? I like this. Man, they called me a month later. I was like, I'm done. And that's how wow. I was the game, bro. That's true. That's true. Chris, that's a true story, man. Mm. I was like, you know what? And I'm going to tell you like this, Chris. The blessing for me was I always tell people, it's kind of like when when let's let's think about a relationship you had. Let's say you're dating this girl, and let's say you you know you decide this girl ain't for you. You break up with her. Let's right. say that Rose says, "Hey Chris, how was how was that girl? Oh, she was just cool. You know, she wasn't the right thing for me." Right. Let's flip the script and say that same girl you dated, and she broke up with you. She broke your heart. Somebody says, "Hey Chris, how they? Oh man, that girl she ain't no good. You know what I'm saying? Because right. you're mad right. about it, right? Right. But the NFL is that girl, and you can go out one of two ways." Either they can break up with you or you can break up with them. And Chris, I'm going to tell you like this. I did not go to practice that day thinking I was going to walk away from the NFL. I promise mm. you I was going to play that year with the Redskins. But when mm. I woke up that day and went out to practice, my heart told me I was done. And I can wow. honestly tell you, Chris, to this day, bro, I have no regrets. I don't I don't have one regret. I mean, I tell you that when I broke up the NFL, the rest of my life, I – I know in my heart that I broke up with them. They didn't break up with me. And it's, right. it's just, it's a different feeling, man. And I'm going to tell you, I didn't do it for that reason. And I didn't even know about it at that point. But when God put it in my heart, because I didn't love it. And at that mm-hmm. point, to be honest with you, Chris, my son was two years old. All I wanted to do was be a dad, raise my son and enjoy life. And, and I went from New Orleans for five years to a year in San Francisco to then a year to Cleveland then the, I was I was like I can't I'm not gonna keep doing this I'm not gonna keep I'm not gonna play for 20 different NFL teams and 20 mm. I'm not doing it and mm. I made the decision that enough was enough and I'm gonna tell you right now bro it was one of the great decisions that I made because for the rest of my life I broke up with that girl that girl didn't break up with me. <laughs> you are listening to Irv Smith on the Zorch podcast. You know Irv, it's funny because when you're able to make that decision and you can walk away. Life is a lot easier. It really and is. I say that because I know, you know, guys, I know guys who are playing for to pay mortgage. They're playing to maybe pay for school. They're, they're, they're playing because they're married, whatever it is. When they're told they're done, something snaps. It's like, man, hey, I've been playing this game since I was 6, 10, whatever it is. Yep. But when you leave on your own terms, right. it's like you smile and you're happy. That's and right. you can watch an NFL game and go, oh, wow, that, that's great. You, you enjoy it more versus having this chip on your shoulder that a lot of guys have because they were cut too soon or, hey, it didn't work out for me or that coach didn't know what he was talking about. He, he blackballed me out of the league. Now I can't play anymore. That's right. Chris. And, and it's so interesting because I hear that what, what you're talking about, I mean, you felt good. You, 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 hey, man, I had a great run. It was terrific. I enjoyed it. But you talked to a lot of other guys who kept on playing, bouncing from team to team, got cut here, got cut there, got an injury. Then all of a sudden, oh, damn, that's the NFL, man. It pissed me. Yeah, I, I, don't, even watch it. I don't even watch it anymore. <laughs> you, you can enjoy it. Facts, man. Everything you said, Chris, you're a thousand percent right. And I'm telling you, man, you know, some some of us are fortunate enough to go out on our own terms, and some guys they gotta drag him out. And you are listening to the Zorch podcast with Irv Smith Sr., I must say now. And you just finished a great story talking about kind of being there for your son. Um I want to ask you a question that I asked you earlier, but you had a chance to kind of live through it twice. So that means that how was it for draft day 
in 2019 for your son? Because I think this is amazing. A lot of people don't have a chance to kind of go through their own draft day and then have a chance to kind of go with, go go through it with their son. Can you share with us how that experience was? It was amazing. You know, my son's goal, he wanted to be a first rounder. Um, it was a tough draft. There was two other guys that were, I mean, they were just specimens. The, the two kids from Iowa, they were both first round. Okay. Uh, one got drafted by the Broncos. One got drafted by the uh, Detroit Lions, both in the first round. And my son was the third tight end. We knew he was probably going to be the third tight end. And there were some teams that had a legitimate shot at picking him in the first round. And, you know, he was like me. His goal was to go first round, and he didn't. And so we had a party first day. He didn't go. It was a little disappointing for him. But at the end of the day, it was what it was. It was. And then he got drafted the second day, and it, it, it worked. It was the It was the best situation for him. Um, just being there and being able to, you know, being through everything that he went through before to be able to just lead him and, and help him and make sure that he was comfortable with everything that he did was a blessing for me because I went through it 30 years earlier. I mean, it, it was what it was. I mean, everything he did, he's a tight end. I mean, there was, he went to Alabama, I went to Notre Dame. I mean, it's like everything he did, it was like, I'm just, I'm just drawing the script for him and just saying, just stay the course. And I remember the day he called me and said, Dad, you know, it was his junior year. Because his first year, he played behind a guy named O.J. Howard, who was a stud. O.J. got drafted in the first round. His second year, he actually played. He played a little bit. You know, he had a decent little season. Nothing great, nothing bad, but he had a decent season. Right. He had a national championship. And then his third season, he just crushed. And so we didn't think after his second season he'd be coming out as a junior. I mean, he was just, you know, whatever. So he calls me one day, probably toward the middle of the end of the season. He's like, Dad, you know what? He said, I'm thinking about coming out this year. What are you thinking? I was like, Irv, you know what, bro? I'm like, bro, you, you, you know what? I think I think there's a legitimate shot. I said, we, we said, I'm making a decision right now. Finish the season strong. I said, but if everything goes the way you're doing it, I don't see why you can't. And wow. played, finished the season up. He had, I mean, he broke every Ozzie Newsom tight end receiving record Alabama there was. He did, I mean, he did his thing. Wow. And after the bowl game, um, I was in San Francisco. They played Cle Clemson. They got beat up on. I flew back to Phoenix, jumped on a plane the next day, flew to Alabama, met with him and Coach Saban because Saban, you know, Saban, of course, wants to convince you to stay. And he, you know, sure. I wanted to go as a dad and support him. So I flew down there. We spent about three days down there, met with Saban twice. And my son was like, I want to go. Saban tried to convince him to stay. And Irv was like, you know what? I want to go. And so he made the decision and we put the wheels in motion. You know, and got everything set up to, to get him moving forward. And I tell you, when draft day got there, he did everything he could do to put himself in the best position to go as early as possible. Mm. When he didn't go first day, it was like, hey, man, don't you're good. And then after the fact, he ended up going second day in Minnesota. And it was like, but here's what's crazy. I'm going to break it on this one. So about seven years ago, I'm back in Notre Dame doing uh, one of those fantasy camps or something like that. Right. And and I, I did the camp with uh, Kyle, Kyle Rudolph. Me and Kyle was there, tight ends again. Spent some time with him. We exchanged phone numbers. It was the first time I ever met him, last time I ever met him. My son gets drafted. Within five minutes of my son getting drafted, I looked at my phone. I put Kyle's uh, name and number in there, and I sent him a text. And I said, Kyle, I said, my son's coming to Minnesota. I said, I'm going to ask you as a favor at Notre Dame, look out for my son. He was like, mm. he said, Ur, he said, Big Irv. He said, I will do everything in my power to make sure little Ir Irv Jr. is successful on and off the field. That's that's how wow. that's a true story. You know what I'm saying? Wow. And I can tell you this, Kyle was true to his word. My son got there, man, and my son was like, Dad, Kyle is awesome. He's looking out. Mm. And and even though my son, obviously, NFL is a, is a job. Sure. My son's there to take food out of Kyle's family's mouth. But Kyle, Kyle's a great player. And Kyle looked out for my son. And when Kyle got picked up by the Giants, I sent him a text. I said, Kyle, I thank you for everything you did for my son the last two years. And he's like, Big Irv, he said, y'all keep doing your thing. He said, he said, you know how we do it at Notre Dame. So, I mean, mm. it, once again, man, it's a fraternity, man. You know what I'm saying? And um, what a blessing it is and, and what a blessing it is to be able to, you know, to be a part of the Notre Dame fraternity for the rest of our lives and to be able to help other people in the process. Sure. Well, you know, Irv, this is kind of an interesting story then because – as I was doing my research, and this is something I didn't know, I just assumed that maybe it, it just wasn't in the cards, but 
you had reached out to Reggie Brooks about your son wanting to go to Notre Dame. Well, Chris, let and me tell you like that this. didn't happen. Let me tell you like this, Chris. Um, when, when, when the time my son was a sophomore in high school, I had made it very clear to Reggie and the whole program. I said, my son, my son told me like that. I want, I want to go to Notre Dame like you. All right, cool. So I made some phone calls. I let Reggie know. Reggie's like, Irv, cool. We got him. And my son was one of the top tight ends coming out of high school. I mean, Alabama obviously went crazy over him. And finally, the my, my son's high school coach finally got a hold of the guy at Notre Dame. And the guy was doing his little rounds in the south part of the country. And he came to my son's school. And my co son's coach called me. And, and the guy was there. He was in and out of Irv's school in 10 minutes and didn't even say bye. And I called Reggie. Really? Irv, I don't know what's going on. And I mean, I'm like begging these folks, like, look, my son, want, he don't want to go nowhere else. And so finally, the guy, the guy said, they're just not interested. So I let my son know. I said, look, Irv, I'm sorry, bro. I don't know what the deal is, but they're just not interested. He said, all right, cool. And then, you know, he had Texas and Florida and Alabama. And I mean, all the big schools wanted them, but Notre Dame, they weren't interested. And, you know, it, it hurt my feelings because. I'm like, how can I be a, a, a guy that was a first round pick at Notre Dame? All the stuff I, I've done and been involved with the university, and they won't even give my son a shot. Like, look at him. And then, you know, then my son goes to Alabama, wins the national championship, blows it up, gets drafted by the Minnesota Vikings, and they're like, oops, we made a mistake. No, you didn't make you didn't you, you only make a mistake if you try. You didn't even try. So exactly. It's exactly. It, it's yeah. You didn't try, so you, you you didn't try. But at the end of the day, I'll tell you this, man. I am so grateful that the Notre Dame did not bring my son in because everything happened exactly how it was supposed to happen. Mm. I know this for a fact. Mm. And with Notre Dame, it wouldn't turn out the same way. Mm. I can tell you that for a fact. But you know, it is what it is. But yeah, truth and fact, fact, Chris, it did hurt my feelings because sure. not only did my son play football, but he was a tight end like me. And he's a stud. I'm like, how you gonna have a guy who played there, did his thing, got drafted, and y'all don't even give his child a shit? But here's the thing. I'm not the only guy. There's a bunch right. of other former guys like myself right. that were studs in Notre Dame. I right. mean, Rocket Ishmael, they didn't offer – Rocket so – I, I, I can't even – I ain't close to Rocket Ishmael, and they didn't offer his kid a scholarship. <laughs> so I'm like, if they will offer Rocket's kid a scholarship, I'm have a chance. <laughs> Well, you know, it's just, it's so interesting because, I mean, you've had a chance to be involved with a major, major program, and now your son doesn't have the chance to be involved in the same type of program that you were at, but arguably, possibly even part of a better program with the legacy that Nick Saban is going to leave on this game. And so, well, as you mentioned – having the chance to be at Alabama for three years. I mean, what was that experience like for both of you guys? I can honestly tell you, Chris, it was it was some of the funnest three years of my life because it was a different environment than it was at Notre Dame, but it was so fun and refreshing. I mean, they got cheers and chants, and I got a chance to be on the inside. Like, it's one thing when you're, like, looking at it from the outside in. you like, you right. can see but I was the parent that was at every, I mean, I was there I mean, I was in the dorm and I was in the meetings and I was in all the, mm. the I was invited to the stuff because I was a parent. So mm. I could see that Nick Saban requires his kids to go to college and he wants them to graduate and he wants them to play major football. And it's no different than, out, than Notre Dame. I mean, mm -hmm. every kid ain't going to make the NFL at Alabama. Right. 99% of them aren't. Right. Now, we put out a lot of kids now mm -hmm. in this but we did at Notre Dame too. But there's still a whole lot of kids that will never see the inside of an NFL training camp, no different than Notre Dame. So right. they still prepare their kids for life after football. And I can tell you that it was a lot of fun. I met some amazing coaches. Um, Charlie Weiss's son was a coach at my son for Coach Irv at Alabama his freshman year. Okay. Um, a couple other coaches, people that went to Notre Dame, lots of people that, that were that are Notre Dame people were a part of Alabama program when my son was there. So it was kind of cool mm. because it was Alabama, but there's still people that are Notre Dame people that are still involved. Right. And it's a great program. It really is a great program. And it was a lot of fun. And Nick Saban's an amazing guy. I look at Nick Saban like the modern day Lou Holtz. Sure. 
And sure. So that's I amazing. Played for Coach Holtz and my son played for Nick Saban. It was all good. Mm. And, and you know, and that's something that as you guys get older, as he has his great illustrious 10, 15 year career, you guys can look back on this and kind of share these moments. And so although different generations, it's still a father and son conversation about kind of what excellence is and the fact that you guys are both able to reach it. I mean, you talk about people that don't have a chance to see an NFL training camp. I mean, I'm sure there's a handful, but how many parents have played in the NFL and have their their, their kids that have played in the NFL as well? Yeah, it, it's cool. Going, you know, going, you know, his freshman year, his rookie year, obviously, there was no coronavirus. So I was, right. you know, I, I literally went to every, every preseason game. I went to every regular season game, home and away. I went to every postseason. I didn't miss anything. I mean, I was at every game, home, mm. everything. And, you know, just being able to sit there as a parent and watch. And that's all I did. I mean, I've never really took a big part in coaching him. I've always allowed whatever if, if he's on a if he's on a, a good program with a good coach, their job is to coach him. I told his Alabama coach, I said your job is to coach him. My job is right. to watch. Him. Right. And so same thing in, in, in Minnesota. I'm like, hey, just got playing NFL. Your job is to coach him. My job is to watch him. So I'm I go watch the games as a parent, you know, and and enjoy it. But um being but but the other thing too is like you and I being former players, we watch we watch the game differently. Sure. You know? And sure. We we watch the release. You know, we we watch what they do up for you. Know, we we they, they both people watch fans. They watch results. We watch right. everything. Right. You know what I'm saying? They watch and see if you caught the ball, if you didn't catch the ball. We we watch the route. Did you right. run a good route? You know? <laughs> exactly. So, exactly. But, but 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 I never coach him, even when he does. I, I never critique. I just watch it and I enjoy it, and it's been a lot of fun. So, as a parent who watches kind of every second, every moment. What's been your favorite moment that you've had a chance to see him play in the NFL? You know, um, getting to what you know, I, I just you know, as, as a tight end, you know, our, our funnest things is, of course, touchdowns. And, sure. You know, I've had an opportunity to watch him make some really good plays, some fun plays. You know, he's had a few games where he's caught two touchdowns in the game. I just like to see him be successful, and I like to see him smile. Because he's, you know, and, and that that to me, when he walks off the field and he's smiling, you know, that's 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 the world to me. You know, that's mm. all it comes down to, you know. So that's awesome. You know, we're parents. All we want to do is see our kids happy, and so that is absolutely that's awesome. What it's all about, you know. I mean, I mean, I, I, it's funny because when he was Alabama, I remember, I remember the, the game they won that championship. You know, we won the last play of the game, and I just remember, you know, I, I remember it's like I was there with a couple of my buddies, and I mean. You know, when they won that game, I mean, I'm I'm picking up my buddy and grabbing like I wasn't that. You know, what I'm saying I didn't oh, win it, but the, the wow. way you feel when when you see success for your your children, your child, sure. you know, it's it's better it's better seeing them have success than this seeing yourself have success. Sure, sure. Well, and I'm, we're gonna wind down a little bit, but really, was it in your parents' DNA or was it in the water in New Jersey? But how did how do you produce three tight ends within kind of two generations. I mean, how does that happen? You and your brother and your son. I mean, what, seriously, I mean, how does that happen? The only thing I can tell you, Chris, is nothing but God, bro. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the reason I say that, because you have to understand, I mean, think about, like you said, our DNA. Think about our bodies, our size. We don't control that. Our parents don't control that. God controls that. Right. If I'm five foot six or five eight or five ten, you and I aren't talking right now. Right. If my son is five foot six, five eight, five ten, there's lots of guys that play in the NFL that are six foot six and their kids are five foot five. So I do all the time, you know, just because I was a big tight end, I mean, my son, I mean, I got buddies that, you know, I'm out in, in California last year, uh, in California two years ago with Junior Bryant, our old teammate, and he's got his son is a little old dude. Junior's bigger than me. <laughs> we, we don't we don't control that we're blessed when our kids are athletic and they 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 meet the criteria the look the the you know that and fortunately my brother's big as i am he's six four you know he played at about 260 270 and same for me and my son he's more of a hybrid he's about six three about 
two forty five. He's that that new class of tight end, but it's nothing but God, man. God chooses, you know, He chooses people to be doctors, lawyers, sure, engineers, and football players. <laughs> We're just so like, you've been around a lot of locker rooms. Um, can you talk to us about kind of what you ran across some of the best leaders or kind of the best cultures? I mean, you seem to really kind of pumped about what was going on in San Francisco. I mean, can you talk to us maybe about kind of a, so some leadership or some culture on some teams that you really enjoy? Yeah, definitely, man. You know, it's all about morale. It's about leadership. Um, it starts at the top. I mean, the, the greatest leadership I had was coming from Notre Dame. We had Coach Holtz, who, in my opinion, he wasn't a great coach. He was a great motivator. Mm-hmm. But he knew. I mean, you knew he knew how to rally us up to the point where we run through a wall for him. Right. He knew right. how to build us up. He knew how to bring us down. And then we had great leaders in the locker room. We had the Chris Zorches. We had the Michael Stonebreakers. We had the Tony Rices. And we had the Frank Stan. I mean, we had so many leaders. And then you get to the NFL, and you've got – some good leaders and you got not some not so good leaders. Why a lot of these coaches are getting fired. And I was in New I was in New Orleans where we had we had quarterback by committee. We I never had the same quarterback two years in a row. People ask me who my wow. people ask me who my quarterbacks in New Orleans were. Okay, I'll give you like this. I started off with Wade Wilson, my friend my rookie year. Then I had Jim Everett. Then I had Heath Schuler. Then I had Danny Werfel. I had Mike Buck. I mean I had wow. uh, I had your dude from Miami. Um, what's his name? Um, I mean, when I tell you that it was quarterback by committee, mm. then I go to San Francisco. I got Steve Young. It's a little different. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I had I had Jim Moore, who was an ex Marine drill sergeant. Okay, he was Jim Moore is a cool guy, but he he was a drill. That's what he was. He used to tell us that it pained us when people didn't practice. He said, mm. he said, I feel like you earn your money during the week. Then I go to San Francisco, you got Steve Marucci who's like, oh no, no, no. We 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 you earn your money by winning football games on Sunday. Oh. If if you if you feel if you're tweaked a little bit, he said, take off. Just mm. be ready mm. for Sunday. Mm. You no, know? we had Steve Young, we had Jerry Rice, you know, we had Merton Hanks, we had Ken Norton Jr., we had Chris Dolman. When I say leadership in that locker room. We mm. had leadership. That's why we were so successful. That's why it was the greatest year. The one of all the years I played, that was the best year of my life because for the one time, I felt like I was back at Notre Dame. Wow. Then I, then I went to Cleveland. Had a guy named Chris Palmer. Chris Palmer was first-time coach, coach on the Belichick. It was terrible. Mm. Nobody liked him. Leadership was terrible. Nobody wanted to be there. You know, so... I've, you know, I was forced. I've been around good and I've been around bad, so I know the difference. Sure, 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 absolutely. Kind of going on, on those lines, um, when you think about mentors you've had, um, who do you think, and this is outside of your parents, because hopefully, as any good kid would say, well, you know, my parents are my mentors. But outside of your parents, I mean, who would you say – as a mentor, most influenced your life? Well, you know, when I was in high school, my freshman year, you know, when you're a freshman, you're that kid that, um, you know, you want to be like these sophomores, juniors, and seniors, but you're a freshman. You know, we practiced on a field that was called the Dust Bowl. It was like this little field that was no grass, a bunch of dirt, and that was all we had. <laughs> and the varsity was practicing on the, the, the side, right. the, the side <laughs> and the stadium. And, it's soft, right? So we're practicing every day, and nobody's watching us. The, the varsity got people up in the stands watching them, and they got guys getting ready for college, and they're special. So one right. day, we're out there practicing. This dude was walking around the field. We had no clue who he was. He had a hat on. And he had a clipboard. We like, oh, we got we got a scout out here looking at us. So we out there doing <laughs> our thing. So after practice, our coach introduced the guy to us. Lo and behold, he was a local youth minister at a church around the corner from our school. His name was John Saucier. Okay. This dude ended up leading me to Christ my freshman year in high school, and he's been one of my best friends ever since. That was wow. five years ago. And wow. it was crazy because 
he left after my my junior year in high school and moved to Ohio. Okay. And lo and behold, when I got with the Cleveland Browns, guess what? He and I was back in business again together. Mm. Came mm. to my game, spent time with me. But we always stayed in touch, though. Mm -hmm. And so this guy, and I, I still talk to him this day, man, he's one of my greatest uh, mentors, one of my greatest supporters. Um, you know, you talk about a guy that before I was anybody, before I was anybody's anybody, you know, he, he was there. I can tell you stories about taking me and a bunch of my buddies camping and things like that. And he's always been like a big brother mentor to me. And I tell you, man, I was very blessed. To, I'm truly blessed to this day to have him in my life. That's amazing, man. That is amazing. Well, Irv Smith Sr., this, this, this just wasn't that bad, was it? No, oh, this is awesome, man. I tell you, wasn't man. Wasn't that bad, man. Reminiscing on things I ain't thought about in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's selfishly, for me, that's what I'm getting, right? Because it is so interesting. You talked about this before. How, because we have that bond, you know, I was talking to Tom Gatewood, who uh, who played for Notre Dame in the 60s, and, I mean, I'm just enthralled about his stories, you know. So, selfishly for me, this has been a great opportunity, one, to re reconnect with former teammates like yourself, but then also to kind of get this history, this, this um, really, the, the, this history, I feel, this, this history about Notre Dame football, when it's not talking about, you know, hey, how many touchdowns did you score? How many tackles did you have? I mean, I had Mike Stonebreaker on, and I find out why he didn't play his sophomore year because he was on probation and the story behind it, which <laughs> I didn't know. I just knew, damn, you know, he wasn't playing. Now, that was my freshman year, so this is a stud walking around, this, the supposed stud linebacker. That 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 is is just a beast, but he ain't playing. That That's all I knew. Yeah, and I room with the guy, right? I mean, so this is the information I'm finding out. So it's so cool to have a chance to kind of reminisce and and talk and stuff like that. So I want to say thank you very much. I, I I do appreciate this. This has been a special moment for me. Well, I tell you, man, when you called when you when you asked me to be on the show, man, I felt honored because honestly, Chris, you were always one of those. You know, when I got to Notre Dame, bro, you were you you were. Chris Zorich. I mean, that's all you had to say. You know what I'm saying? And but you know, you were like a brother to to me and a lot of us. But you still, whether you realize it or not, you know, you, you were you were you were very special. You know what I'm saying? You weren't just any old guy at Notre Dame. You were Chris. And, and to this day, when people ask me like, "You played Notre Dame?" I say, "Yeah." And I, I put this on everything I love, bro. When they ask me about the like, okay, Irv, who tell me some of the guys you played with? If I name off five guys. Chris Orris is always one of those five guys. <laughs> it's Chris, it's T. Rice, oh. Tony, but I guarantee you, you're always one of those five guys. <laughs> I'm like, I know there's no Chris. Like, oh yeah, I remember Chris. So I'm like, I play with, yeah, I play with Chris. You know what I'm saying? And I'm telling wow. you, know, you for, for the rest of my life, you will always be one of those five guys. They ask me, all right, Herb, who'd you play with? You always be one of those top, those five guys. I put that on everything, bro. Sir, thank you very much. I'm very honored. I still remember uh, running up to, there were a whole bunch of football players that lived in Grace. And I remember every now and then I'd go visit some of my guys who were uh, in my class, but then also I'd be hanging out with you and Nick for a little bit too. So it's sure. a small world, man. Very yeah. small world. Absolutely. I'm going to make sure I let uh, Derek, uh, make sure I let Nick know that I was blessed to be on your show and, and let him <laughs> Absolutely, man. And, and I'm, I'm actually going to talk to him about being on as well. So I'd like to thank everybody for watching and listening to this episode of the Zorch Podcast. And also like to thank my director, my producer, my wonderful wife, Candy, who without her, I would not be able to do this. This podcast, along with others, are on my YouTube page at youtube.com slash chriszorch50, as well as on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Also, check the description below as we have a list of books from Amazon by folks who have been on the podcast like Coach Host, Jerome, and others. Irv, this has been awesome, man. I wish, I wish you and your family much, much success, happiness. Um, not that I wasn't a fan of your sons before, but now, I mean, I'm just going to be rooting on like he was my son, man. Awesome. I
there, brother. Absolutely, brother. I love you, man. Love you back, bro. All right, man. Go Irish. Go Irish. All right, brother.